once again at the Cable Easel with this program which is dedicated to painting and drawing from life. And uh, seeing as how we do an awful lot of landscapes of the local Long Island scene, it's done with a video camera. And um, I've talked about this for a good long time. And here we have a shot taken a few weeks ago uh, of one, another one of those wonderfully uh, beautiful coves here on Long Island. This one happens to be down near East Mauritius, and it's shot looking north. So that is one of the things that keeps us coming back again and again to this wonderful place. And um, to the east is uh, the, the town of Southampton, and to the west is uh, the uh, obviously the town of Brookhaven. And um, these things happen uh, yeah, yeah, on the coastline uh, on this island because of the wonderful uh, proximity that it is to the Atlantic and to the Sound and to the Great South Bay. All these lovely, uh, all these lovely forms take place. And this one happens to be a particularly wonderfully composed uh, landscape. It's got all the elements that I continually talk about and hope that people look for. Um, I love a high horizon line, in other words, because it uh, means that a great deal can take place down on the foreground. And the foreground is the trickiest part of any painting. It's the thing that either makes or breaks a picture. So I'm going to, as, I, as usual, I start from scratch. This is a perfectly blank canvas, and I've got some outlines here to tell me where to stop. And well, this is a little too far off, so I'll just run on down here uh, just to show off with my ability to make a straight line with a brush. Well, I wiggled there, but anyway, um, I do this for many reasons, for, for transporting and for also for matting. And uh, these canvas boards are cuttable, so um, you can make them as small as you want to. Here, let, let's, let's do the, um, let me, let me, let me uh, t t talk about this horizon line. The word, hor the horizon line um, is the um, root of the word horizontal, meaning that it is a horizontal line, straight across. We live on a planet whereby this is unnatural. Actually, it should be curved, but we're too close to it. When you get far enough away, it becomes curved. But at this point, it, it is uh, flat. Uh, Columbus um, uh, would have, was out to prove that the world wasn't flat, and I'm out to prove that it is flat when you're looking at the landscape this way. And so uh, e even though we know that it should curve, uh, the span is not wide enough. Here is a, uh, here is a two, well, it's actually a two-line composition. It tells you all sorts of things. It tells you that this is the sky area, and this is the horizon line, and this seems to be a land mass in the distance. That's enough of a composition to start with. And I like to talk about composition because it seems to be a frightening uh, thing for a lot of people who are starting landscaping. And uh, so I'm going to simplify it. Here's the third line. This is the, uh, this is the way you designate where this tree formation is. That's all you need, the placement of it. Um, and then there's another little one here. And then it comes, it's going to come another uh, single line, if you, if you want, uh, that, that is the, um, the uh, shape of the coastline. And it goes in a, in a sort of a, of a diagonal, which is what I'm always after. But it has these lovely patterns that, are, that, are, uh, that make for such interest here in the foreground. These continue out to the little rocks out in the water. And here we have the, um, uh, the approaching the foreground which is where I said earlier, a foreground is one of the most difficult parts of a painting. And uh, I don't think too many people pay, atten pay enough attention to it. So I'm going to try and pay attention to the foreground now. Uh, the interest of the objects in the foreground are what close the composition in. You, you, it becomes a sort of a framing device. 
And here is this, here in the, in the, uh, in the uh, very close foreground, are these rock formations. Just going to place them. I'm, I'm not going to attempt to draw them now, but just I'm going to place them so that you'll be able to, so that when we get to it, you can, um, you can see the, the, the evolution of this kind of composition. And they occupy, these occupy a nice lo lot of room over here in the foreground. And intense shadows make for a very dramatic look, and it also gives you the dark and, and uh, very solid uh, uh, anatomy of a rock. Uh, w w rocks are very hard substances, and when they are painted, they ought to also imply their texture. And uh, that can be best done by having brilliant sunlight on them and, uh, and have the shadows as dark as you, uh, as, as you see them here. Some of them are lying in the water, and whatever is happening here in the foreground, here is the water, here is the line of the wet sand, uh, and here is the dry sand, and, you, and some, some nice little interruptions in this, in this uh, foreground of patterns of very peculiar shapes, but also very understandable. We understand these shapes. Uh, later on, as the painting proceeds, this rock will be put into the water, and then this line of, um, ooh, let me see, this one ends here, and then there is a, um, then there's some larger ones. So uh, the closer they come to you, the larger they become and the more solid. Uh, they can be interpreted in a sort of, an, uh, sort of a, an impressionistic way in the distance, so that these could become nothing more than just dots as you, um, as you paint. But this is the general feeling about how you compose a picture. Somewhere back here, there is a paler area. It is so distant that it is no, there is no detail, but it obviously is some sort of a shoreline against the land mass. Um, so here is composition. It, it, looks, uh, it looks as though it um, is uh, complex, but it actually isn't when you are working from a subject matter. It's when you try to invent that you are in trouble. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of other programs uh, just tell you that you can begin to apply paint to canvas and not worry about composition. And uh, I'm here to uh, prove otherwise. Well. As, uh, as usual, uh, you work against, uh, not, not just for the television program, but you, wonder, well, you work against time when you're out there in the open. First of all, time, time passes, and um, lighting changes, and the day becomes shorter and sh shorter. So the idea is to work as quickly as possible when you're out of doors, and then to refine it when you get back to your uh, protected and closed environment, where, whatever that may be, whether it's the attic, the kitchen, the basement, a studio, or just the backyard. Uh, so uh, I, I mix, and I do not, uh, I've said this many times before, and it's always worth repeating, to mix on the canvas is perfectly acceptable. It eliminates the need for a... Um, for an elaborate palette, and it also is a very uh, efficient way of getting color onto a large area with a palette knife. Uh, whether you choose to have the uh, technique as smooth or to have it textured and very bumpy and very painterly, or whether you choose to have it uh, uh, smooth. Uh, this can be, these are, all of this area can be um, smoothed out with a brush. I'll show you in just a second how to do it. But as you can see, uh, it takes a uh, very little amount of time to spread the color on the canvas with this nice, nice little uh, $1.95 uh, palette knife. Uh, this is a plastic. It is uh, very useful. It is also uh, unnecessary to buy a eight, nine, ten, twelve dollar palette knife. I was pr pricing them today at Scribe's Art Shop up in Port Jefferson uh, Station, and uh, there are um, there are fifteen and sixteen dollar stainless steel palette knives, which are uh, okay. I mean, they're wonderful and they're nice things to have, but in a way, these do the same kind of work. So um, uh, spending tremendous sums of money uh, on these supplies, it can, can wait until later when you, uh, when you f uh, learn to know the difference between the uh, bouncy and, and springy quality of a stainless steel palette knife and the little bit more uh, resisting quality of this knife. However, it does the same thing as the other one does. It wipes off perfectly clean so that when you uh, want to go to the next color, you have a perfectly clean palette. That's the price mark. That yellow is the, what is the price. Uh, we'll get, take that off, but here is the side that's important. And the, um, the light is shining, telling you that here's a, uh, here's a pristine and clean palette knife ready to go on to. Well, I, I mentioned the business about smoothing out the, um, smoothing this out 
a sable brush. A lot of a lot of people say never put sable brush on oil. Well, that's uh, that's um, that's always uh, a dangerous thing to say never, because all things are possible if the effect that you're after is achieved. All I'm doing is to get rid of a few of the uh, of the obviously uh, palette knifey um, forms here because I have done palette knife paintings before and have left them exactly like that. But this is going to be a painting with uh, a smooth technique. All the techniques are acceptable if they're well done. And so there is no, um, there is no, this is better than, than uh, something else. There, we have here uh, what I call uh, the uh, quite wonderful cloudless Long Island sky. And uh, that happens uh, during the year very, very often. And it's always very wonderful to just not have to worry about clouds. And it also gives a feeling of enormous tranquility. I find that a cloudless sky works very nicely on the psyche. You, uh, you find yourself um, perfectly willing to accept this somewhat cut out uh, background and um, without any grading of color with no blending to the horizon this happens occasionally on very clear days when there's been a good front coming through and there is no uh, there is no atmosphere to worry about so a cloudless long island day is uh, is it is, is where the cloud is is where the um, the sky is a very friendly thing to paint. Uh, it does not require a tremendous amount of attention. No blending and, uh, and uh, no clouds. So here the land mass, so way off in the distance, I'm going to put a little bit of purple in that to, to, to lower the green value because we are not at the time of year yet, at least this shot wasn't at the time of year yet, where everything is extremely green and summery. Uh, there, is still a, uh, there is still a few places where the uh, the great foliage um, areas are, haven't turned uh, what I call s uh, summer green. Uh, I'm not fond of summer green. It's very hard to live with. It's also hard to paint convincingly. So these subdued, um, these subdued greens are accomplished by, and I really must remember to tell you how I mix these colors because the letters that I get from people say, you don't tell us often enough how you, how you reach the colors. All right, so the color, this color is, is, is um, the base, of course, is a, a small amount of white, a touch of my favorite green, the only green that I'll spring out of a tube, which is sap green, and then some, uh, some uh, burnt umber and some yellow. It has made this tone and a touch of the purple, as I t told you, to reduce the intensity of green. I, I was complaining uh, in the art shop the other day that the, uh, the paint companies have not seen fit to produce what I call an interesting, deep, rich green. I don't know why. They want you, uh, the painter, to mix the wonderful deep greens which are just about everywhere in, in landscape paintings. And I, and, and, and I probably ought to uh, put out a line of paints called just plain green and then maybe i would stop complaining about the uh, the fact that greens coming from the tube are really unattractive and have absolutely nothing to do with nature in general well here we have two colors we are now working towards the foreground because i always work from the the furthest part away and it's a, it is a somewhat interpretive but it is also extremely uh easy to recognize that this is the uh, the the distant landmass and, and while, I'm, while we're focusing on that, I'm going to show you just the way one can interpret uh, a, a small white, apparently a small white structure way off in the distance here. And it does not have to be uh, anything more than just a suggestion that there, is a, uh, that there is human habitation way off there in the distance. There is no possibility of being able to de uh, determine exactly what it is, but it is off there. Uh, brilliant white in the sunshine, but it's a something. And, um, and there's another something over here. Uh, just some pure white out of the tube will tell you that something is happening over here. And that's what makes, it, uh, that's what makes oil paintings so uh, genuinely fascinating. I do believe that there is a sort of a, a cliff arrangement way in, the, way in the distance there that has a sort of a rosy tone to it. And I'm going to interpret that just by... Uh, the rosy tone is obtained by... Uh, some of the green that I use, a little bit more white, and a touch of what uh, the paint company calls flesh tone, uh, a, a dumb name for a, for a very useful color. Uh, I rarely use it, almost never use it in portraiture, but I sure do use it in, um, in landscape painting. So if these are bare rocks uh, with just some growth above, then that's, that's all you need to do to interpret that one. Then we have here 
once again, the use of white as a base. Uh, and there's my palette uh, leaning up against the easel and a, t a touch of um, a touch of the flesh color, call it rosy amber. And the beach, uh, the beach type of, um, of uh, well, it's not enough. I've got to get some more white. I've uh, used up, uh, I've used up all the white. And here's a great big tube of white that um, is the only way to buy this. Do not buy small tubes of white. You go through them much too quickly. And when you're out there, you'll find that you've run out of it and your whole painting uh, day has to come to an immediate end by not having enough white with you. The white is the basic color of al almost everything that you paint in landscapes. Here is that beachy color, a little, still a little bit too dark, um, and uh, put on rather thick because uh, oil paintings are, um, are uh, interesting for their texture as well as for their color. And um, a little bit of texture is always uh, very important. So we have here uh, a, um, this is part one, obviously. I mean, every, everybody knows that I do these landscapes in two different parts. Part one and part two, this is part one. Uh, it has a name, and I shall, uh, as soon as we come back from the break, I shall tell you the name of this cove. There are so many different names that I'll tell you what it is uh, when we come back. In the meantime, just let me take a quick break, and I'll need to squeeze some more white out, so I'll be right back. back again, uh, presumably with everything under control, but that's probably never really the case in uh, whether it's this studio or a private studio. Uh, there is always a certain amount of chaos taking place. All right, what I have just done is to mix some color. And um, uh, I, the base is, is white, a touch of the Marajay medium, which is what I always use, a touch of what is called manganese blue, and some spectrum uh, violet uh, to to get a uh, to get the tone which looks to me like one of those wonderful rich deep colors that Long Island waters get at certain times of the year and um, they are uh, they are not found in the tube ultramarine blue is and white is about the closest that you can get but I seem to have mislaid my ultramarine uh, blue and so you have to learn how to uh, mix the colors that you want if you don't have the ones that are labeled the color you want so I think that's the cerulean blue with a touch of the, um, of the spectrum uh, violet uh, works rather well. And as you can see, the palette knife is doing the job of getting this nice sharp line against the, um, against the beach, uh, which is way off there in the distance. And speaking of the distance, um, uh, Mike Fagan, who shot this scene, tells me that what I assumed uh, was a, a bunch of cliffs in the distance is actually the rooftops of an apartment complex which makes my heart sink uh, at the thought that on such a cove, however, the people who live there must get a wonderful view of this, uh, of this cove. It's called Hearts Beach in, East Mar in the East Mauritius area. And so um, that much you have learned. And also here I'm, I'm going to be needing some more white. And this, this time I'm going to uh, squeeze it right on the canvas and mix it 
with some of the blue that I have left because as the, as the uh, water color approaches you, or the color of the water, before somebody becomes confused about what I'm doing here, um, uh, becomes paler as you get to, uh, uh, towards, the, uh, towards the foreground. So I've mixed some of the, um, some of the blue that I, uh, that I used here in the, in the deep part and mixed it with some, uh, some quick drying white, which means that um, this will be uh, well dry within a matter of possibly uh, half an hour as opposed to uh, two or three days, which is what it takes usually to, um, to uh, dry oils, uh, so depending, of course, upon how thickly you, you, you use them. I'm blending, as you can see, as I go along somewhat to get this, the, the, the texture of this water. And as I see, I see over here through some wonderful, uh, whatever, the, whatever the cause of this lovely pale blue diagonal line is that's way off there in the distance, it's, um, it, is, it is there and it's what, ma it's what makes working from life uh, so interesting. You work, from, you work from either photographs or from what you think you remember of a place and you don't really get those details. And that blue line is inexplicable. I'm not sh quite, sure, quite sure why it's there, but something is happening on the surface of the water which, which, uh, which has done it. Uh, and I think that you'll agree that it's, uh, it, it makes for, the, for interest in the, in the final composition. As, we're coming for, as I'm coming forward here, this blue is beginning to change in tone. I'm going to go right over those rocks because I need to prepare the background to, to paint the rocks. There seems to be, so there seems to be a color uh, which is, uh, the water of course is transparent. We all know that water is transparent, so when it's shallow, uh, you can, uh, it, usually uh, the color looks as though you can be, see the uh, ground at the bottom of wherever this water is. And it looks to me as though the, uh, the bottom, this is shallow enough for the bottom to be uh, shining through the water, or to be visible through the water, and so uh, uh, the uh, the color of the water will change uh, due to the fact of how shallow it is. Uh, always always a, uh, an interesting observation to make, and it happens when you're out there working from life. You you discover these mysterious things happening, and you uh, and it is explained to you as you work, as you go, as you proceed with the painting. And if you do question what you see, and I sort of apparently question what I see a great deal of the time, you realize that it's got to do with all sorts of conditions, uh, namely the time of day as well as the, um, as the uh, shallowness or the depth of the water. So here we have uh, the application of, uh, of the blue for this, uh, for this cove, and it's going to have to be worked at. But I need to get the color on so that I can uh, blend and paint, uh, as it were, uh, with the existing colors. This is the way uh, that you can be pretty well assured that you're going to be getting uh, a, um, an accurate or at least a, uh, an acceptable explanation of what it is that happens with the water. Because uh, many times the, uh, the change of water surface, uh, the wind conditions and so on, will change the color of the water dramatically as, the, as time goes on. And I'm going to blend these two. As you can see, I've got this sort of semi-transparent uh, sandy beach bluish tone here, and it is gradually blending off into the, uh, into the darker blue, which is further away. Uh, many times, water, when it is close to you, is darker than it is in the distance. So getting out there in the, in the, uh, in lo on location is the way you find out and the way you, uh, you really can seem to understand the enormous uh, variety of conditions that make for the enormous variety of, uh, of the way landscapes form visually. Um, the, uh, these wonderful coves here are uh, really peculiar to Long Island because Long Island has got a very uh, erratic coastline. Uh, seeing as how it used to be part of Connecticut a very, very long time ago when the Wisconsin Glacier pushed the southern shore of Connecticut down in and formed Long Island and also uh, the water rushed in and formed Long Island Sound, which uh, is a rather unique body of water uh, and which uh, makes the weather conditions really uh, very erratic. Uh, I've been told many times that Long Island Sound can be compared to a uh, fireman's hose uh, turned on into a bucket. 
uh, water. It is a, it is a uh, fascinating pe uh, body of water, but it's also extremely dangerous and, and very unpredictable. But these little coves are, uh, and, as, and as I'm talking to you, uh, I'm blending this and trying to get some feeling of, of, the, of the difference between the way this, the way this uh, water towards the shoreline uh, is, um, changes in tone and why. So the deliberate strokes are the, are, are the thing that I'm always concerned with and, and the lack of explanation of what the deliberate strokes are supposed to do in some of the programs that I've seen uh, bother me. But here I'm going to give you the, some feeling about how to give the, some, some motion of this, of this, um, of this uh, water surface here. There are little waves that are, that are forming and they are working their way towards the land. Uh, uh, um, uh, a condition that I'm not quite sure I understand, but uh, this is what I see, and this is what you can pick up when you're working. Oops, wrong. That's not right. You take that right off. The uh, the pattern of these of these um, of these uh, little waves on the surface are important because they can tell you very much um, which way the wind is going. And I've always said uh, you have to be a r reporter when you're doing these scenes. And uh, I'm going to do what they call unpaint these in a minute. This is a putting these on, and when, when I unpaint them, you'll understand what I mean. They will become much more subtle and, um, and uh, much more believable. If you can't make your audience believe what you're talking about, then you, then you failed, and you have to keep at it until you can <laughs> uh, certainly make it very clear. So these little, these little um, uh, wavelets uh, can, now be, uh, can now be reduced to... Uh, just a sort of a suggestion of what they are by um, activating the oils before they dry too quickly and uh, by, by giving you some texture of these, um, of these uh, un painted but and yet unpainted uh, waves. Uh, I try to explain this business of this technique because it took me a long time to figure this out and, and, and maybe if I could save you all the years that it's taken me to figure this out, uh, it'll be of some use. You can pull some of this pale color up into the um, up into the darker ones, and that'll give you some uh, give you also another maybe understandable uh, technique uh, uh, explanation of these waves. Here in the, um, the time is running out on this first half, and so the second half is going to have to be devoted to doing uh, the land. But in the um, in the water, uh, there is um, there is a uh, there are a whole mess of rocks, and we'll just do the ones in the distance and see whether or not an interpretive way uh, can be done to uh, to um, to give you some illusion that there are rocks way off there in the distance. And here they are, just sort of little dots in the water, nothing nothing elaborate, and, and just uh, just a question of of, of suggestion. Uh, that one doesn't go out too far. And there's some nice white things there, throwing some lovely reflections. And here's a great long line of, the, obviously these are old jetties, or, or, or um, I'm sure that they're old jetties uh, that uh, are either no longer in use or the tide is so high that it's covered up the bottoms of them. But here is a, is a general, this is the dark color first, and the light color will go on uh, to, show, to show the tops of, the, uh, of these rocks and these jetties. The, um, the need to just be interpretive at this point is very important. Well, very important. It's somewhat important, and it's going to. Um, let me just put one reflection in before we, before I, kiss you all goodbye. Here, here is a uh, a white something on the end of this jetty, and here is the reflection below it. Now that should tell a story, and it did not take very long, but it did take some observation. In any case, this is the end of this particular phase of um, of doing Hart's uh, Beach or Cove down near uh, East Mauritius, and please, um, I hope that if this is a Interesting enough, you'll tune in for the next half hour, uh, whereby we resolve the painting of the land and the rocks in the foreground. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Bye-bye.